As the world around us continues to change, Florida Blue remains focused on our commitment to help keep Florida at its healthiest. With Medicare Advantage HMO plans that received Medicare's highest rating, five out of five stars. And you can switch today. No need to wait for the annual enrollment period. So call or visit online now. It starts with the benefit of $0 monthly plan premiums. But staying healthy is now more important than ever. So Florida Blue Medicare's five stars go even further with enhanced benefits like $0 outpatient mental health services, $0 primary care telehealth available 24-7, 90-day prescription supply by mail, and free support from neighborhood nurses, all part of our five-star commitment to you. So call 866-308-6110 and get the five-star rated Medicare HMO plan that's right for you. Our experts are standing by. Call and switch today. Everyone, welcome to the very first Blue Seat of 2021. We are excited about our guests today and even excited as well too that continuing in 2021, we have Florida Blue supporting the Blue Seat. Nigel, welcome to the blue seat. It's a little different. You're wearing the blue shirt, so thank you for that representation. <laughs> I had to find one, so all, all <laughs> successful, yes. Wonderful. Well, let's tell our viewers just a little bit more about Nigel Allen. He's the President and Chief Advancement Officer with TMH Foundation, and he's joining us with a very important topic today, and it's the impacts of a global pandemic on nonprofit operations. And who better to share and give us some insight than Nigel. So Nigel has served in the capacity of the Chief Advancement Officer with TMH since 2018, October of 2018. We roughly yep. started around the same time. I started at any in yep. August 2018, Great. Nigel. Um, but he is responsible for leading a variety of branding and fundraising activities to support the overall mission of TMH, as well as its 15 service lines. He and his colleagues work directly with donors to increase the impact and the charitable giving um, and philanthrop uh, philanthropic goals um, and help our make, make our community one of the healthiest in the nation. There's awards that have been given to TMH. Uh, so prior to TMH, Nigel was the president of the Big Ben Hospice Foundation. Uh, he serves on the board, um, a number of boards, but more importantly, uh, Second Harvest, and then also a former board member of the Tallahassee Symphony and the Big Ben Chapter Association of Fundraising Professionals. He is married to Anna and has two wonderful daughters, three stepsons, and three grandchildren. Wow, yep. that's enough to keep you busy, Nigel. It, it certainly does. So <laughs> makes life fun. Completely. So. It keeps you young, right? Can't you tell? Yes. <laughs> so they say. Yes. Well, tell us about the mission of TMH. I think some of our audience may not be familiar exactly what the uh, TMH Foundation mission might be. Sure. And actually, in preparation of this meeting, I wanted to make sure I spoke correctly. So I, I went and looked it up. So I will give you a literal description of the uh, mission of the TMH Foundation. And then I'll try to simplify it into how we, we try to live it uh, each and every day. Uh, the mission of the TMH Foundation is to develop and sustain financial support for TMH and generate community understanding and involvement as a means to accomplish TMH's mission, vision, goals, and objectives, and to maybe translate into non-corporate speak. Uh, what it means is that we are look. We our goal is to raise funds that we can use to support many different service lines within our healthcare system uh, and make sure that we can provide patients with the very best possible care and fill in any blanks on, uh, on the funding side where we just don't have enough funds uh, from our normal budgeting process to provide optimal uh, support for patients. And I can give some great examples of that uh, a little bit further on in our conversation. Oh, that's but a big fantastic. part of it as well is to evangelize, tell the story of how the TMH Foundation is supporting the community with the funds that get so generously donated to us. And actually, I know we're gonna be talking about COVID, but there are some really strong examples in the last year of how the foundation has been able to tap into strong community support for the hospital and provide some really important services that were very much needed during this, this terrible pandemic we've been facing. 
Yep, thank you. I'm looking forward to having more dialogue about that as well. But you know, on a personal note, Nigel, can you share a little bit more about maybe the transition from Big Ben Hospice after being there for like six years and then transitioning to TMH? I'm curious on a professional um, level as to how was that transition for you moving from one type of organization sure. to another, even though it's still within the same human services sector? Sure. And, and you know, it's also within the same healthcare arena. So, you know, in, in many cases, the donors who were generously supporting Big Ben Hospice were also supporting TMH, and that actually kind of makes sense. And I think that was a somewhat of a benefit for me and for TMH. But I'd say the biggest difference between the two organizations really has to do with scope and size. Uh, Big Ben Hospice, you know, really focuses on one specific kind of of support for patients and families. And it, they do it beautifully. It is essential, you know, when you are talking about life's final chapter, uh, very few people kind of go into a situation when a loved one may be dying and knows exactly what to do. You, know, you don't wanna think about it. And then all of a sudden you're being confronted with all sorts of changes in reality. And you're also in a situation where you know, this is the final chapter of life and, and you don't want to be just sitting there reacting and scared. You want to try to squeeze every moment of living and loving uh, somebody that you can. And a great thing about hospice care, especially when it's done well, the way Big Ben Hospice has done it and not-for-profit hospices do it in general, is that, you know, that support that is received by Big Ben Hospice really can go to do some amazing transformative things. Um, people can look back, obviously, uh, with some sadness about uh, the loved one they've lost, but they can also look back uh, and hopefully smile because they had some special memories that they can cherish and hold with them uh, that, that kind of confirmed, you know, the importance and the meaningfulness of the relationships that were had and the life that was lived. So very singular kind of focus on hospice care. And in some ways, after a while that gets, I wouldn't say that it's easy, but it's kind of a one note focus when it came to fundraising and messaging. And I, I mean nothing negative by that. Also, when I talked about scale, you know, Big Ben Hospice has about uh, maybe 300 employees. TMH has over 5,500 employees. The service areas that we have, you know, we, we provide care up into Georgia. We go much farther west and east than uh, my former employer does. And probably most important, uh, it, it's a little bit like instead of just focusing on a one organization, i.e. Big Ben Hospice, you have all these other very important organizations that are included under the TMH umbrella. We're taking care of cancer patients. We're taking care of, you know, heart and vascular patients, diabetic uh, patients. The list goes on and on and on. We have all these different service lines. And in many cases, each of those service lines, as a comparison, are significantly bigger on their own than what my last employer's scope was. So it, it's forced me or it's challenged me to kind of broaden how I try to kind of tell the story of what we do for the community, why it matters, and invite people to, you know, help TMH provide the best possible care in every single way. Oh, that's fantastic. And thank you for sharing that, that personal note on the, the career transition and the impact that both organizations have. Yeah. Um, and not just impact on the community and those we serve, but also the economic impact when you threw out, again, the number of people that are employed at TMH and the number of people employed at hospice. So sure. nonprofits, again, have that economic impact in the community with employment. So tell us about how the pandemic has impacted the foundation's daily operations. How has that influenced decisions that you've had to make? Oh, just a little <laughs> bit. Uh, <laughs> um, and actually, in some ways, uh, you know, if what's the saying, if you're given lemons, try to squeeze some lemonade out of it. Uh, it's, you know, when you can't do certain things because of a situation like the pandemic, you can either sit there frozen or you can kind of just get back to work 
and figure out a different way to meet your objectives. Uh, the pandemic had a major impact on the hospital, obviously, but also um, you know, our, our foundation and the work we do. A lot of awareness for the TMH Foundation through the years has been based on you know, its big event, the Golden Gala. You know, we had to cancel that or postpone it uh, halfway through our, our planning for it. Uh, we had a number of other special events that all had to be canceled or postponed or dramatically changed. Yet, we still needed to, that, that didn't mean that we were told, okay, you guys just, you know, take the rest of the year off and come back when we can all go out. So it forced us to think real hard about the kind of messaging that we were going to share and uh, to invite people to support TMH in ways that related to the pandemic. And in a way, we were luckier than a lot of not-for-profits in that TMH was really at the center, ground zero, of the impact of the pandemic. You know, the great fear was that TMH was going to become overwhelmed with patients. We wouldn't have the ability to do things. We were also, as a hospital, hit very hard by the fact that uh, we had to stop doing any kind uh, of surgeries except for emergency surgeries. And that's where a lot of the revenue the hospital gets comes in from. So we were facing all these losses. And you know, so we, we implemented two different campaigns to fundraise uh, as the pandemic hit. The first one was a campaign that specifically focused on telling the community that we desperately needed their support to increase the number of telemedicine units that we had throughout our network to be able to safely provide care for patients and for our clinical staffs. You know, reducing face-to-face -face contact was a major issue. And we went out and kind of put in a, a, a request for funding saying, we need your help to add an additional 12 uh, telemedicine units. Well, we ended up getting enough funding support to now having paid for and installed more than 72 telemedicine units which is amazing and it's wonderful. And here are some of the things that these units are letting us do. Uh, you know, patients who are in our COVID unit, uh, we, can, we can reduce the exposure on the part of our clinical teams by having a telemedicine unit in there where some of the, some of the fundamental kinds of communication could take place using the telemedicine unit and keep us from going through you know, limited supply of PPE, you know, physical uh, protection uh, equipment. Every time somebody, one of our caregivers would go into a COVID patient's room, they would have to suit up in something that looked a little bit like what the astronauts wore, you know, when they went on to the moon to, to protect themselves. So, and, and on average with a COVID patient, the number of times a clinical person would go into their room a day was a minimum of 12 times. So using telemedicine to be able to do that, uh, reduce that significantly. It was also a way where we could connect patients with family members. We recently had a COVID patient who was able to visit with one of their family members in England because we had the technology to you know, really bring them together in a way that couldn't have been done in the same, with the same impact that a telephone would have had. So that was one example in terms of screening. You know, we provide a lot of care outside of the Tallahassee area, and there's all sorts of medical screening that can be done with these telemedicine units virtually. And so we didn't lose time from having uh, caregivers uh, and nurses drive maybe two hours out to somewhere uh, in our region to make one or two appointments. And those folks could check in and have appointments throughout the week in a way that was much more convenient for them. So there are a lot of ways that telemedicine helped. The second way that we fundraised was that we did a campaign to raise funds for what we are calling our COVID-19 emergency fund. There were all sorts of enormous costs the hospital had to bear to convert rooms to negative airflow so that patients uh, would not be transmitting you know, the virus to the rest of the hospital. Uh, we had to retrofit uh, rooms. There were all kinds of expenses. And we've been able, we raised more than $300,000 from the community to kind of 
underwrite some of these costs and services, and we're still using it today. We even use some of those funds to help set up the testing site at Bragg. Uh, there are all sorts of ways that fund has been used that has really, really helped the community. Well, thank you for that, Nigel. I mean, sure. it's so vast with all the money that has been able to been raised, how much you've been able to utilize it um, and how it's spanned across the entire community. And I think that's important to note as well too, is just the outpour of the return from the investment from donors. Um, it was humbling and wonderful to see, you know, when, when we send out a call for help, uh, clearly it's a little bit like Sally Field, you know, getting her Oscar, it's like, wow, you really <laughs> like me. You know, the, it was it was humbling and, and just inspirational to see the kind of support that was provided to us. And I think it made us feel even more the imperative that we have to be good stewards of this money and make sure this money doesn't just sit in an account, but it goes out to help the community. And so much of that money that's come in uh, has already gone out. In fact, during this time of the pandemic, we have doubled the amount of money that went out into the community in supporting our service lines to up to $1.7 million in our last wow. fiscal year. And that's double what we did the year before. And that's, that's thanks amazing. to the community. Yes, that is amazing. It is such a giving community. I'm curious from an executive director perspective, and I'm sure a number of my fellow EDs and peers would want to know the same, for your operating budget, Nigel, I know the pandemic impacted your different revenue lines, but what percentage of your revenue is um, derived from the special events? Because we do know TMH Foundation is putting on amazing events. So what mm -hmm. would you say would be the percentage that's represented on your revenue line for special events? I would say that in, this, in our past fiscal year, which ended at the end of September, yeah, maybe 15 to 20%, which is much less than normal. Uh, I don't want to be too specific because I'll get spanked for it. But uh, I will just say that if you put on an event for 1,500 people at the Civic Center, like the gala, and you're bringing in top tier talents like One Republic or Maroon 5 or James Taylor, that doesn't come cheap. And to put on a, you know, four or five hour concert, dinner and cocktail event for those people doesn't come cheap. So, you know, the gala is a very important event for TMH because it is a way for us to connect with our core physicians and donors within the community. It's a great way for us to, to talk about the important role that TMH plays in the community. And there is some benefit to bringing funds in to support specific programs. But we have to balance that with other fundraising programs to really make sure that we're providing the care and support our community needs. And you know, there's a, there's a calculation that anybody in fundraising should be familiar with, especially when it comes to special events. But the same thing should hold true for any kind of fundraising initiative. And that is, you know, what's my cost to raise a dollar? Um, when for the two campaigns that we did for the telemedicine unit and for the uh, emergency fund, our combined cost to raise a dollar was about three cents. So, and we brought in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, I won't say what our cost to raise a dollar is for the gala, except to say that it's a little bit more. So, you know, you can raise less total money, but end up with more financial support that's available for the community by not focusing as heavily on special events. They play their part, but our biggest success and lesson was that there are other ways to raise money that really go to the heart of meeting need. You know, you don't want, you don't want the special event to be the tail wagging the dog. So just a lesson yeah. reinforced, we all know it, but sometimes, you know, we, we get locked into something and it, we have a hard time extricating ourselves because we've always done it and people expect it. But if it doesn't do that core issue of uh, increasing awareness and generating financial support, I think we have to think really long and hard about why we should continue doing certain events. 
I agree completely. Well, on that note, that's one great nugget of advice. What other advice would you offer to any of our nonprofit leaders on how they may be able to pivot as a result of the impacts of this pandemic? Sure. And, and the, I, I have been known to repeat a couple of sayings over and over again. And I found that those sayings have even more meaning to me now during the pandemic because they really go to the heart of why we fundraise and you know how we can support an organization whose mission we believe strongly in. Uh, one thing for anybody who's in the business is make sure you're working for an organization you really believe in and you would want to contribute to even if you didn't work there. You know, I've been lucky for both uh, TMH and Big Ben Hospice. That's been a very easy decision for me to make and believe in strongly. Uh, and I, because I've worked at both places and I've seen, as they say, how the sausage is made, you know, I have even more confidence uh, as an existing donor for both of those organizations. But the, here are some of the things that I think are important. Uh, you're not giving to an organization, you're giving through an organization. So when we talk to our donors uh, and we invite them to support us, it's not just because we are not-for-profit ABC, it's because we're making something important happen in the community and we believe that the donor will feel strongly enough that they want to become a part of solving a problem. And another quote that I like a lot that I think was very apropos for TMH uh, is that if you aren't giving your donor a problem to solve, they have nothing to do. You know, you, it's not a lot of, there's some, and we love them. There's some donors who just give to you because, you know, because there's some connection. But if you're giving because you know that that money is going to go and reduce suffering and make your community a better place, that's, you know, that's so much easier to talk about. And, you know, I think that especially during a pandemic when we're fighting against this illness that's killed close to a half a million people already in this country. Uh, that's pretty relevant stuff. And the other one, since I'll give you th a three, uh, is facts tell, but stories sell. I mean, if you go and you say, yes, we serve 25,000 people in this area and we do X and Y and Z, you know, that's, that's reciting something from an almanac. But if you tell a story about Mary who wasn't, you know, who wasn't going to be able to eat a meal uh, the next day and your support will make that possible, that's something people can visualize that really matters to them. You know, to bring it back to TMH, one of the bigger expenditures that came out of our emergency fund was for our cancer center. And, you know, people still you know, cancer is still out there uh, and touches lots and lots of lives. Um, people have cancer are immune suppressed and they're far more susceptible and to the, the coronavirus. So we spent over $100,000 to purchase a surfaceide uh, UV ultraviolet cleaning system for our cancer center building, where every night we are able to set that up in our infusion areas and our treatment rooms. And it, it, it's like magic. It you know, kind of measures the room and puts out this ultraviolet uh, blanket uh, that will literally remove 99.99% of all bacteria, of viruses. It's kind of a super cleaning system so that our cancer patients coming in for infusions don't have to worry that by coming in here, they had an increased chance of catching the virus. So, you know, that's an example where it, when somebody donated to cancer center funds and support, I think everybody can feel good that that money went to a purpose that really was saving lives and mattering to their loved ones who may be at the center at this time as well. Yeah, and I think every nonprofit, obviously, to have started as a nonprofit, you've identified a problem. You know, and sharing that problem and keeping that in the forefront is very important. And I thank you for that nugget because oftentimes sure. I have to remember that myself, even with any. One of my favorite questions I'm excited to ask you as well is, um, so are there any hidden talents or discoveries about yourself 
that you've unveiled as a result of this era of COVID. And I'll give you an example. I mean, I've, okay. I've discovered the love of art, um, of painting. So now I have all this paint and canvases and who knew that Felina loved to paint. Uh, some people have taken up cooking and baking and some of these hidden talents they didn't know they had. So what has Nigel either a hidden talent that you've unveiled about yourself or maybe a self-discovery? I'll go in the self-discovery area because uh, I, <laughs> I can't think of any remarkable talents that I'd, I'd want to talk about <laughs> or be known for. Uh, you know, one difference between TMH and Big Ben Hospice is as a large organization, there are more people who I'm working with. And I would say that, uh, and I'm, I've brought in, uh, there's been some turnover in our staff since I got here. And there are some really remarkably talented, wonderful people who are working with me at the foundation. And I think one of the things that I have come to discover is that I can let go and trust my wonderful colleagues to do great work. I don't have to be responsible for everything. And by changing my thinking and just making sure that a big part of my job is to help them be successful and let them get the wins. I don't need to get the wins. TMH needs to get the wins. And sometimes I think this comes just with age and I'm at the part of my life where uh, with any luck, this will be my last full-time job. I, what matters to me is not climbing any kind of a corporate ladder. What matters to me is what kind of legacy uh, the foundation can leave for the community. And if we can make the foundation an even more impactful place that helps people who are sick or scared uh, through the support and the successes we've had. So I would say letting go a little bit has been a discovery that I'm, I've been glad to see. Well, that is a big discovery, <laughs> Nigel. <laughs> and again, I guess credit to the gray hair um, on your head, that wisdom that comes with it. <laughs> You've earned all the gray hairs <laughs> by yes. far. That's well, a lot so of them are leaving town too, I've seen, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> it's not an option. Well, yep. Nigel, again, thank you so much for your support of any. Thank you for your time today in the blue seat. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and being very transparent. Um, we look forward to future conversations and sharing more. Thanks, Lena, and thank you for the remarkable work that you're doing with any, any, you know, under your leadership has become such an important resource for so many organizations in our community. And I'm really grateful for everything that you're offering to me and to my colleagues. So thank you. Oh, really you're grateful. welcome. You're welcome. And please extend a hello to um, Ann Munson, a former yes. board member, and Rebecca Lutz who is also a member of any on a professional Two side. Of my <laughs> superstars, I need to just get out of their way. They're very <laughs> So I automatically thought of them earlier when you were saying surrounding yourself with an amazing team. So yeah. you definitely have that. Well, Nigel, thank you again so much for time in the sure. blue seat. We wish you well. And of course, we're here to serve you and your team whenever we can. Thank you so much. Right, Thanks, everybody. Care.